Hello and welcome to Famine in the Land. My name is Rick Becker. The path out of deception, a, a journey that many of us have, have undertaken when God graciously opened our eyes to the deception that it, it we were caught up in. Um, you know, people who've come out of churches like the New Apostolic Reformation or Word of Faith Church or Prosperity Gospel Church or some other form of deception will tell you that it's sometimes a long and, and painful process. And um, there are some factors that determine the speed of our recovery, uh, the obvious one being the length of time we were involved in the church. The longer we've been involved, the, the, the higher the possibility that we've established very um, close friendships, friendships that mean a lot to us. We have a, a support system around us. And this, in fact, becomes one of the obstacles when people should leave the church that they know is uh, involved in deception or that's uh, teaching false doctrines is because they don't want to lose their friends. And of course, the longer you're in a church, the more you've been subjected to false teachings and you've become accustomed to the bizarre manifestations and, and practices of the church. So there's a lot to unlearn. And then secondly, another factor that, that often pops up um, in my dealings with people who have come out of deception is, is the experiences that they've had in these churches. And uh, they've had real experiences. And as we all know, emotions and feelings uh, play a vital role in our lives. And so they really struggle with, with experiences that they've had. Um, they maybe felt something or maybe seen something in the church. So they're a little bit confused, you know, because they associate what they felt with the work of the Holy Spirit. So it, it creates a real uh, problem in their lives, trying to you know, figure out how can I have been deceived when I really felt God was moving in that particular junction. And uh, perhaps you've heard the saying, a man who has an argument is always at the mercy of a man who has an experience. And this is exactly the problem. Um, however, a man who depends on his experiences is at the mercy of an angel of light or false signs and wonders. Um, I remember many, many years ago, I was in, in a conversation with some Mormon missionaries and I asked him, how would I know uh, if Joseph Smith was a true prophet? Or how would I know if the Book of Mormon was true? And their reply was that it's going to be some sort of feeling, some sort of inner mystical confirmation. In fact, uh, in the Book of Mormon, in, in Doctrine and Covenants, it's written, but behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you, Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. And so this is a very similar problem, especially in the, in the New Apostolic Reformation, where it's such an experience-based Christianity, so dependent on encounters with God and uh, uh, manifestations. Uh, it's a real problem. And um, it's no different then from, from uh, determining truth as far as the Mormon religion is concerned. If you felt something, if you, you felt the heat of the Holy Spirit in your body or you were slain in the spirit or you felt tingling sensations and you attributed that to the work of the Holy Spirit. So those two, those are two sort of primary factors that determine the speed of the recovery. Um, so you cannot undo the length of time you were involved in a church. You cannot undo the experiences, but there's a way to process them. And, uh, you know, the more work you put into your recovery, the faster your recovery will be. Um, there's really no shortcut in studying the word of God and learning to rightly divide the scriptures. And that's going to be a key uh, instrument in your recovery. Um, and if you haven't seen episode two, Recovering from the NAR Back to the Bible, I really encourage you to go and listen to that because there I explain the role of the scriptures in our recovery. But today we'll take a, a brief look at the stages that we may go through when we're coming out of deception. Um, I was a charismatic pastor. I was involved in the, the charismatic move for well over two decades. I was deeply entrenched in the system, in the beliefs, and in the practices. And um, after I came out, I looked back at my life and, and I identified certain stages that I went through. So that's what we're going to go through today. You know, a very, very um, a brief and, and, and quick look at them. Uh, it's not going to be a long episode today. So the first stage that I'm sure you'll, you'll recognize, and you'll probably identify with quite a few of these stages, and uh, sometimes, you know, you can experience one stage before the other, so this is not set in concrete. So the first stage is what I call the shaking, and that is when God begins to open our eyes uh, to the deception that we're involved in, and he can use 
quite a few different means. And I'll just briefly touch on a few. Uh, it could be an incident that exposes the manipulative and controlling behavior of the leadership. Um, it could be the fact that we read an article uh, or saw a video on our favorite pastor or teacher, and uh, we realize that what they're teaching is wrong, and, and we are shown clearly how they twist the scriptures. Um, we can also become uncomfortable. This, In my case, I became really uncomfortable with a lot of the manifestations that I saw in the practices and the bizarre behavior that I saw going on in the church. Um, and then another one is that our expectations aren't realized. Um, you know, false uh, false teachings offer false promises. And when those promises aren't realized, we begin to question things. So, for example, many people are caught up uh, or get involved in the NAR, uh, Word of Faith and Health and Wealth Gospel, because they want to, they're looking for physical healing. They've had a really bad medical diagnosis and they're desperate for help. So they're looking for a cure. And uh, another example would be tithing. You know, people are, are taught to tithe and uh, sow their seed, especially if they're battling financially. And Benny Hinn is a master of this, you know. Um, so people get out, give out of desperation in the hopes that God will now bless them financially. And all they're doing is, is enriching a, a false prophet. And uh, the situation actually gets worse. And that's when they begin to ask questions. But then, of course, uh, we're surrounded by passionate people uh, who experience things and speak about things and always seem to have a mountaintop experience. And we find ourselves just not experiencing anything, feeling nothing. And we can never attain to the level of, of passion that they have. And we become discouraged and we begin to ask questions. And Unfortunately, you know, very often we think the problem is with us when in actual fact, it's not. Um, then, of course, uh, sometimes, you know, you you, uh, you question things in the church and you begin to ask questions and you approach your leader. And uh, you'll find, you know, initially they're very um, open. But once you start putting uh, difficult questions in front of them that they can't answer, you'll find that the attitude changes. And that's when they turn on you and they'll accuse you of being uh, rebellious or having a religious spirit or operating out of hurt that's one of the favorite ones and so that can be a real eye-opening experiences an experience um then of course uh in the past decade we've seen the numerous scandals that have plagued the visible church uh and huge ministries uh, men with huge ministries have been exposed uh name a few bill hybels brian houston uh, mark bickle and uh, of course now you know, this last week, last two weeks, the news about uh, Robert Morris uh, has broken. And uh, unfortunately, uh, all these men, uh, they were red flags way before their the, uh, predatory behavior was exposed. And the red, red flag was their teachings. All of them sort of built an empire on twisting the scriptures, on tickling ears. But that went unnoticed, unfortunately, because the bar is so low in the visible church uh, to compare what is taught from the pulpit to what the scriptures actually teach. And uh, just on the Morris, Robert Morris issue, now I'm amazed, I've seen so many people defend this man. I mean, this man uh, should be in jail. And uh, people say, oh, but it happened 30 years ago. Well, if it happened 30 years ago to a member of your family, would you not want justice? And uh, obviously we know that God can forgive him if he repents, but he hasn't repented because as we know, he's, he covered the whole thing up. And uh, you know, just look at the, the, the thief on the cross next to Christ. Um, Christ forgave him, but Christ didn't deliver him from the earthly justice that he deserved. And that's the case with Robert Morris. Uh, you know, the, the guy, as I said, really should be in jail. And um, sadly, Gateway will do what every other church has done with uh, when their leader falls. Rebrand, move on, get a new leader. And the problem is they'll be teaching the same false teachings. It's a really, really sad situation. But anyway, those are some of the, the things that, that shake our, our faith and uh, cause us to question things. And, and that's the, the initial sort of spark, if you will, that starts us on the journey of uh, looking for answers. And that, in fact, is the second stage that we go through. So first it's a shaking and then becomes a searching. And uh, this is the time we're looking for answers. And sadly, uh, you know, a lot of people go from the NAR, they see the deception involved there and uh, the eyes are open, but they go into another form of deception. Uh, it could be Eastern Orthodoxy, it could be Hebrews Roots Movements, the Hebrews Root Movement, or some other form of deception. 
So it's really, really important during the searching phase that you uh, find the right resources and uh, uh, find uh, surround yourself with people who have, who have been through it or know about it and are able to educate you and, and show you from the word of God uh, where you went wrong or what your mistaken beliefs were. And, uh, you know, in today's age, there's really no excuse because online, there's there's so much information online. There's free Bible studies, free commentaries, uh, free resources that, that are easily accessible to uh, to help you find the correct answer. So that's the uh, second stage, the searching, what I call the searching. And uh, then comes the inevitable, the third phrase and uh, or stage, and that's what I call the separation. So the separation is a stage where, you know, initially people, there's a real struggle. And it's really difficult to leave. But uh, you'll find that you'll become increasingly ostracized as you begin to ask questions and, and look for answers. And, uh, you know, people will tell that there's, there's something off. And uh, if they can't get you back into the fold as quickly as possible, and they're going to start a really sometimes horrible process where they will slander you, accuse you, and... Um, it's not going to be pleasant. And uh, this is what you really need to keep in mind. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. And of course, these are the, the divisive people. The divisive people are not the people asking questions or asking, uh, critiquing uh, false teachings and, and uh, false teachers. The divisive people are the people who are teaching the false doctrines contrary to the doctrine that was taught uh, in the scriptures and by the apostles. And so, um, you know, you have to realize that by sitting under a pastor who's disqualified uh, because they cannot rightly divide the word of truth, uh, you're sitting under a wolf in sheep's clothing and you actually, in some way, contributing to the ministry just by your presence being there. And so there really is no alternative but to leave. Um, now, in uh, episode one, if you haven't watched it, I'd encourage you to watch it. The, it's called The Grip of the Cult-like New Apostolic Reformation. Identify a few reasons or a few excuses that people have to stay on in the church. So these are not valid reasons to stay in a church that you know teaches false doctrines. Number one, people uh, think to themselves, I'll just ignore the bad teaching. I'll, I'll eat the meat and spit out the bones. Uh, the second uh, reason, they'll say, oh, they think, oh, you know, I'll just stay and, and, and be a witness. Uh, the third reason, they have family members or friends in the church, and uh, they're scared also that if they leave the church, you know, they might offend their family. They might have family members who are involved or leaders in the church, and uh, it's going to cause a real division in the family. And then they think that, you know, they stand to lose too much. They've invested heavily in their time, money. Uh, and so, you know, they, they just think of the alternative, you know, they'll be isolated and, and a little bit lost. And so they, they rather stick with what they know. And then another excuse, uh, they say that despite some doctrine, uh, bad doctrine, false teaching, God still moves. And there we go back to the point I made initially in the beginning, that they're depending on their experiences and their feelings. Uh, another reason they give is they think that if they leave the church, they'll be without a spiritual covering which is false because they're not under a spiritual covering. As I said, they're under a wolf. Uh, another reason they think uh, that they can't leave is that they play a valuable role in the church. They might be the secretary, they might be involved in the worship or lead a home group or cell group, and they think that they're disappointing people. But actually, if they stay, they'll just be disappointing God because uh, God commands them to come out of, of these false teachings and false churches. And so that's... Uh, that phase and uh, the third phase or the third stage, and then become then then comes a really a, a difficult one, and that I've called the sifting. So, let me just read from Hebrews four verse twelve: For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And I really like what Matthew Henry has to say about this verse. He says. It will discover, that means the word of God, will discover to men their thoughts and purposes, the vileness of many, the bad principles they are moved by, the sinful ends they act to. So God in his mercy has, has opened our eyes to deception, but now begins the, the process of sifting us. And sifting, the, the intention, sifting is not to destroy the wheat, but to purify it. And that is the stage we're going through now. 
So if the shaking was the equivalent of our house falling down, the sifting is the stage where we examine our foundation to find out why it fell down and what was wrong with our foundation. So during the searching phase, we examined the teachings that ensnared us. And during the sifting phase, we process or examine our own hearts. And, uh, you know, it's quite a, a, an important verse in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 to 4. Uh, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And what a lot of people sometimes miss there is the issue is not the false teachers, but the itching ears or people who are catering to their passions. So this is, is where we begin to realize that the problem is, is not so much the false teacher deceived us, but ourselves, our ears had an itch, or we were lazy, didn't study the Bible, or the word of God for ourselves. And so this is all part of the painful sifting stage. Um, and uh, in episode one, this, the episode I referred to earlier, the grip of the cult-like New Apostolic Reformation, I list a few reasons why so many people have been captivated by false teachings. And I'll just, I'll just list them here, but please go and listen to that episode if you haven't, where I go into it in more detail. People are looking for a cure for pain, physical or emotional. And then on a deeper level, some people are looking for a reason for the pain and suffering in this world, or perhaps they're questioning their purpose in this world. And uh, then on a superficial level, the attraction is simple as this. People are looking for formula for favor and success. And uh, then it's people are also looking for some kind of experience or to have some, some kind of encounter with God, as they've heard all these stories emanating from Bethel and, and these other uh, NAR churches and uh, people are also drawn in because they're looking for means of spiritual powers they believe they can prophesy and do greater miracles than Jesus and so they're sucked into the NAR and then of course uh, one of the uh, reasons people are, are pulled into the visible church uh, that they, they are purposefully wicked so it becomes a platform for them for these predators who want to steal your money and abuse people it's a it's a platform for predators so in the sifting process, it's really important to find out what was the hook or what was the bait that drew us into this false church or the false movement. Because if we don't identify that and deal with that, you know, we're still going to be susceptible and vulnerable to fall for a false teaching that, that will promise to cure the same pain or, or just, you know, under a different umbrella. Right. So that's the sifting process. And then comes what I've called the surrender. And, uh, you know, there's there's a, a sort of hopelessness that that's really detrimental and uh, unbiblical. But there's a hopelessness that that sometimes we have to reach that rock bottom stage where we're just done, we are finished, and we really need uh, to trust in Christ and His Word to pull us out of the the pit of despair. And sometimes that rock bottom phase is necessary, where we've just lost all hope. Because our hope, in fact, was a vain hope based on false teachings. And so, you know, if you're in this, this place where you're of, of a deep pit of despair and you're confused and you're hopeless, I just want to encourage you that uh, there is hope. And uh, that is in the word of God, in what Christ has promised us and what he has freely given us. And uh, you just have to uh, set your feelings aside. Um, as I said, you know, we've come out of, especially the NLR, such a, feeling and experientially orientated religion that it's difficult for us to to understand that even in our times when we feel nothing that we did that god is actually doing something in us and working something in us and um you know i've, I've just written a few notes down here and it's it's so important to understand that uh false promises uh, that lured us into false teachings these false promises created an, an expectation and as i said you know when the expectation is not realized we're dis disappointed and we feel actually cheated by god when in fact it's actually the false teachers and perhaps in some instances as we saw in one timothy our own wicked hearts that have deceived us and uh, the sifting you know allows us to see that that all was not well in our own hearts and the surrender is when we lay down all these false expectations that we had and we place them at the foot of the cross and we learn to die to self. 
And that is what the surrender is all about, dying to our own ambitions. And what we have to understand is that um, false teachings and false teachers really offer their followers the exact same thing that the world offers. Health, wealth, status, uh, success, prosperity. And so it is quite a, a, a shock to realize that, wow, God didn't promise a lot of those things that I was hoping for. And the surrender is, is the phase where the, for the first time we actually found our rightful place. And in a way, we've actually been dethroned. We've been dethroned from the, um, you know, like the, the emperor who had no clothes. You know, we thought we were these great, wonderful, amazing people with, uh, they were going to leave a legacy and, and, and you know, God was going to use us in amazing, miraculous ways and we'd build up a huge ministry on earth. And, uh, you know, we dethrone from those vain imaginations and carnal appetites. And the surrender is just a, a phase where we say, Lord, I, I surrender. I give my life to you. I lay down these earthly, worldly, carnal, and even, you know, ambitions that seem to uh, be godly and spiritual, but actually were just based in self-love. And uh, that's what false teaching revolves around it's it's self-love it's narcissistic it boosts the ego and uh it's very very destructive so uh i just wrote the sentence down and i said during this phase we stop searching for what god has already revealed we stop seeking after that which god has already given and we stop desiring that which god never promised and so this is actually the surrender is a wonderful phase because it really you you you've been taken off that hamster wheel going round and round in circles and you finally can just take a breath and trust in what Christ has done for you and it's a beautiful process uh, and it's what we all call to it's uh, what we all call to 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 rest in Christ to trust in Him and to you know stop from this performance orientated Christianity that uh, thinks that uh, we have powers that only God has and that, that we can change and, and decree and declare our future and shift atmospheres and, and determine our own destiny. It's a rest from those uh, carnal wishes. And following on from that is the next stage, the sufficiency. I've called it the sufficiency. So, you know, one of the uh, characteristics of a false teaching or false teachers, is that they become a sort of mediator between you and God. So you're always relying on them for the next new revelation, the, the latest teaching, the latest profound pearls of wisdom or insight that are actually just vain imaginations. And uh, you're chasing after people, you're chasing after that, that prophet, who, the next word of prophecy that you can receive, or a word of knowledge, or you're chasing off the next importation or activation or anointing or the mantle of, a, of somebody who's recently deceased. You can just have their mantles. You can operate in signs and wonders like them. And uh, the sufficiency is when you realize that uh, what God has freely provided is enough. Um, and it really is liberating. It's a migration from self-sufficiency to dependence on Christ alone and being content with what he has given. And uh, during this phase, uh, during this stage, um, you, you can stop straining all your efforts, those fleshly efforts to, to, uh, to receive things that God never promised, to practice things that, that God has forbidden, and to uh, find hidden secrets and mysteries by having an intimate relationship with God. All those vain efforts just fall off, like scales fall from your eyes when you've been, your mind is, is opened to deception and God has revealed the false teachings uh, that ensnared you. Uh, in this phase, you become uh, content with what God has freely given. So, you know, all those days of, uh, of, of uh, decreeing and declaring and, and pleading the blood of Jesus and, and straining to hear the voice of God and, and trying to get a, a word of knowledge that's finally ac accurate, all those days have gone. And, uh, you know, going through this phase, you know, sometimes we uh, we struggle because there's so much activity and buzz and hype in the NAR and, and other churches that this uh, peace and quiet and just 
absolute rest and faith and trust in what Christ has done and, and in his word can, can sometimes be a little bit uh, uh, confusing and overwhelming. And so in this stage, the, the subjective means we relied on make way for the objective and infallible truth, the word of God. Our emotions and our experiences and our expectations are no longer the driving force behind our Christianity. We trust in what Christ has already spoken and that we realize we have already been anointed and uh, we learn that the Holy Spirit is given to all believers. So this stage, the sufficiency produces a steadfast way of living the Christian life. We don't have to depend on those mountaintop experiences to fuel our faith. Our faith is fueled by what Christ has promised and by what has already been revealed in the word of God, which is sufficient. So that's the sufficiency stage. And then, uh, you know, and by the way, this is not a stage, you know, that we go through and complete and then it's done with. This is this is now uh, the, con the habitual and continual life and practice of every Christian. Well, at least it should be. Um, and then, of course, another process that never ends will only end when uh, we go home or when Christ returns, and that is the sanctification. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, the verse continues, and uh, Paul writes that you abstain from sexual immorality, so that's the context, but that is the will of God, our sanctification, and that's a process that's that's not going to end, um, and you may say, well, well, why am I bringing this up? I think it's important because he's specifically in the NAR uh, who teach that, you know, all we have to do to save people is to call out the gold in them. And uh, there's a real downplaying of the sinfulness of sin in 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 the unbeliever. Um, for example, uh, Bill Johnson's son, Eric uh, Johnson, wrote at one point, or he said at one point, every government, every structure, every system, fundamentally and theologically, must start with the concept and idea that people are good and that they mean to do good, even if they're not saved. We have to start from that premise. Of course, that's not the premise uh, that God tells us. We start from the premise that we're by nature children of wrath, uh, under the wrath of God. So specifically, as I said in the NAR, there's a real downplaying on the sinful uh, nature and uh, they even teach that that you know once you're a believer, sin really isn't the problem, and you, you don't actually have a struggle with your your flesh. Consider this statement uh, from Chris Vallotton: "Those of us who know God are not in war, in a war with our flesh. However, we do have a devious, evil enemy who's a sinner." So Vallotton and the you know a lot of times they don't even acknowledge the war that every believer has with their flesh, and this is why they go around a lot of these demon slayers pretending to cast out sins of the flesh. They try to bind what needs to be crucified. They don't understand and they don't recognize the war in the flesh. And they don't understand that Christians uh, have a struggle with their flesh and with sin. Let me just read 1 John 1 verse 8 to 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And uh, once again, back to Matthew Henry, and he comments on, on, on these verses. All who walk near to God in holiness and righteousness are sensible that their best days and duties are mixed with sin. God has given testimony to the sinfulness of the world by providing a sufficient, effectual sacrifice for sin needed in all ages. And the sinfulness of believers themselves is shown by requiring them to continually confess their sins and to apply by faith to the blood of that sacrifice. So, you know, coming out of the NAR or these uh, movements that just elevate man, we're really not aware of our own sin. And so it shouldn't be a shock to you that, that coming out of these movements that you become more aware of your sin and that's the Holy Spirit working within us. That's also going back to the sifting process where he shows us our own uh, wicked desires and the carnality and, and the power of the flesh that so easily tempts us and lures us into the temptation. So that is a never-ending journey, our sanctification. Obviously, we know justification. Positionally, we are righteous before Christ, but our sanctification is continual and uh, God will use in our lives many difficult circumstances 
to conform us into the image of Christ. And then finally, what I've called the sojourning. And uh, now the scriptures are, are very clear regarding the trajectory of this world. Uh, it's not going to be a great end time revival. It's going to be a falling away, a departure from the faith. It's going to be uh, doctrines of demons that are pervasive in the visible church. If you get to the root of uh, false teachings uh, in the so prevalent in the visible church, such as NAR, Word of Faith, Prosperity Gospel, you'll find that they're all rooted in the love of self uh, with the goal of providing earthly comfort, prosperity, success, uh, and status. So the followers of uh, false teachings and false doctrines really have become, become comfortable in this world. They've made this world their home. And uh, they deceive themselves into thinking that, you know, their mandate is to make disciples of all nations. Now, that verse actually means we make disciples of all ethnic groups, of all people. But we don't literally make a disciple of the, the, the United States of America. Or as in my country, uh, South Africa, we have these teachers crying and promising that the nation will be born again in a day. No, it won't. Uh, you know, we make disciples of people. And uh, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. Um, and once we, we exit these false teachings that, that have made the world their home, we realize that we're sojourners in this world. And uh, an eternal perspective really takes a grip on our souls. And we see things in the light that we should see them. Um, and this is what 1 Peter 2 verse 11 reads. Uh, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your souls. So, you know, just like sojourners who are passing through, we're passing through and this world is not our home. And uh, the idea is not to transform cities and nations and, and the society, but to point to a celestial city. Um, so our mission is not to cure the ills of, of society or even the body, but to cure the deadliest ill of all, spiritual death and eternal separation from God, unless people repent. So that concludes uh, today's episode. Those are just some of the stages that you may encounter uh, coming out of deception. And if you're in one of those stages, um, I really encourage you to uh, persevere. And uh, perhaps there's been some helpful, helpful content here that will maybe uh, just make you understand the journey or the path a little bit better but ultimately uh you know keep in mind that if the lord has plucked you graciously opened your eyes and plucked you out of uh, a church like bethel or a new apostolic reformation he's not going to abandon you but you have to make sure that you do your part which is getting stuck into the word of god uh, learning to understand what the bible teaches in context Surround yourself with people who can encourage you as soon as you can, if possible, in your area. Find a local church uh, that can disciple you, that can uh, help you in your journey uh, of uh, serving the Lord and uh, not falling for the temptations and, and traps of these false teachers and false teachings. So thanks for watching and I uh, hope to see you again. Bye-bye.